What happened? Hmm? What happened? Oh, no, nothing, nothing. <laughs> no, nothing, nothing. I'm just being silly. Um, I'm, I was started with. Yeah. All right. So weird. Do you see yourself? Yeah. That is, wow. That's, that's. Is it recording? Yeah, we are. So sorry. That was bar All right. Okay, so let me actually. Okay. Sion, do you mind opening that window, please? Do you mind what? <laughs> opening that window. Opening it. Opening it. Got it. Thank you. All right. So, um, if I remember correctly, um, and noted down correctly on my paper, I think we kind of left uh, the last thing we we sort of started talking about with health insurance. I think in the review. Um, I'll spend like 30-ish minutes on some of the things that we didn't quite get to um, uh, in Friday's review, just to kind of wrap up that sort of summary. Does everybody have this handout that I gave out in review? Yeah. If you don't have it, um, just look on with the neighbor. I don't. I forgot to bring extra copies. Um, I, I, I totally slipped my mind. But I'm going to post this as well. Um, it's not like we're covering a whole lot of the stuff. It's just kind of four little seg segments here. Um, and then we can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. Um, but I imagine a decent part of today will be on the cost-benefit analysis side as well, just because it's kind of the latest topic. Um, and I think it's kind of a common common theme in terms of something that people want to see more of. Um, feel free to move up closer. Just know that, like, if you're in these seats, people are going to be able to see you in the video, which may or may not be what you want. Um, so, or we can just save them for Gerard, who totally will be happy to do that. Um, um, okay, so... Um, all right, so health insurance and health care. So um, there's a bunch of concepts under there, and I think we just started covering this at the end of Friday. Um, That's okay. So the first uh, thing to know is the distinction between the two. So what's the distinction between health insurance and health care? Why, do we, and why, does it, why is it so important that we understand the distinction? Yeah. Because sometimes even if you have health insurance, you still can't afford health care. Right, so insurance is just getting, is, is sort of allowing you to have access when something bad happens. It's not saying how good the care would be, right? So it may be the case in some countries having health insurance but not good health care is actually worse than not having health insurance in a country where health care is pretty good, right? It's not helpful to have health insurance when the care is awful. It just, you know, health insurance just says, oh, you get access to care, but the care may be terrible, and that may be the problem. So just getting universal coverage is not itself valuable unless the care that you get when you are, uh, uh, you know, ill um, is sufficient. So the distinction between health insurance and health care is really important. Could definitely come up in like one of those short answer the essay kind of questions uh, on this topic because I know that the professor and lots of Kennedy School people are particularly uh, keen on this particular point. Um, when we talk about adverse selection, what's the adverse selection problem? And be very specific and what exactly that problem is. So what's the adverse selection problem in healthcare? <coughs> well, excuse me. People who know they are sick and they're going to need more healthcare are the ones that are probably going to purchase insurance. Right. It's, remember, adverse selection before the, the, it's the thing that happens before the transaction, which is the wrong people are entering into the transaction. The sick people want health, health insurance more than the healthy people. Remember that graph that we, that we saw when we made coverage universal? There was a big spike in coverage amongst healthier people, right? Which kind of suggests that adverse selection was going on in the absence of, of you know, sort of universal coverage. I remember, I think it was the Chandra graph from class. I think it's in, in the, the um, slides as well. Um, there's like a spike, right, when coverage was made universal, and it's a spike amongst healthy people, or people in like healthier demographic groups. Um, which is suggesting that if you don't force people to buy insurance, for example, you tend to get just the sicker people who are buying insurance. Um, okay, so that's that's uh, uh, that's the adverse selection point. What about moral hazard? What's the moral hazard concern in health care or health insurance? Yeah. Uh, you're, I mean, if you have health insurance, sometimes it might be possible for you to uh, be less inclined to take care of yourself because you know you have health insurance. Right, so one problem may be that you are less inclined to get that checkup on that thing that you have because you're just like, you know, um, or sorry, more inclined to do it, sorry. Um, like if you cut your hand, for example, you might just be like, ah, I'm just going to go to the doctor because, you know, it's free. Right, so um, the moral hazard point is kind of like people may change their behavior, so there's two things. One is you might be less inclined to take care of yourself 
The other one is that when some things do go wrong, you might be more inclined to go to the doctor. Both of these are behavior changes that may be motivated by the fact that care is, is free or that you don't have to pay for coverage, right? So it encourages you to be more risk-taking, perhaps, and then more, you know, using the system more when, when uh, you know, something does go wrong. Um, so that's kind of the, the uh, moral hazard side. Um, so can people talk about some of the ways that these things have been dealt with? Like, what are some of the possible solutions for these problems in the health context specifically? Was one copay? Right, copay. So what does copay address? It's a deterrent uh, from, uh, mor on the moral hazard side. Right, so it's kind of a moral hazard uh, deterrent, right? So why? Well, because now when you get sick, we, we're worried about you overusing care. Or, or you know, act, like kind of activating your health insurance and overusing care. But if you have to pay a little bit to go to the doctor, you may be less inclined to overuse care, even if it's ten dollars, twenty dollars, or whatever it is. That's a slight disincentive from you overusing care. Um, there's another example in class which is similar to that, or I think it may, it may have been in the homework. Uh, it was a similar example that was kind of geared towards reducing moral hazard. Does anyone remember? On the side of the patient, or it was yeah, patient side. Uh, there was the, you only had to pay for your ER visit if you actually, yeah. or if you didn't end up in the hospital. Right, so it's, it's, it's like, you, if, if you go to the ER and you didn't end up in the hospital, you have to pay for your ER visit. Why would that be moral hazard uh, uh, eliminating or, or preventing? What's, what is that, what is I that trying ERs to do? I think ERs in particular are very expensive, um, and it's much less expensive for people to go to their doctor. Um, so it's disincentivizing people from going to the ER when they could be paid for Right, so the problem is, like, if, if the ER is free for you, a lot of people will show up at the ER, and they won't know who to treat, because um, they, um, yeah, so they won't, uh, you know, they won't exactly know who to treat, um, because there's so many people in here, I don't know who really, really needs care, right? Some people say, my chest hurts, someone else says, my chest hurts, one of them is having a heart attack, the other one is just really, um, you know, like, like um, overreacting to something small, right, um, or a smaller issue. Um, you want people to sort of self-police a little bit. And one way to do that is to say, like, look, if you're actually having a heart attack, we want you here. Or we want you to come in, we want to treat you for free. But if you aren't having a heart attack and you just come in constantly for no particular reason and you say you have the same diagnosis as someone who has a serious problem just so you can get care, um, or just because you're, you're really <coughs> sensitive um, to that kind of thing, then we want you to self-police a little bit so that you don't show up so we can actually treat the people who... Um, who are having problems. So you want to be able to brainstorm and think about ways to eliminate um, both of these issues. One, one way for, to eliminate the adverse selection problem is this universal coverage idea, right? So in the same way uh, that we talked about last semester, um, universal coverage kind of deals with this pooling problem. So if we make everyone buy the care, um, you want to be able to talk about what would happen to the health market. Like what, how would that affect health insurance? Well, presumably, uh, if the models are right, then the cost of health insurance would go down, but because now you have a lot more healthy people in the pool, so the average person who has health insurance needs less coverage, needs less care, and that means health insurance would be cheaper. So in other words, the healthy people will be paying sort of for the sick people to some extent, but that's okay because the healthy people will eventually become sick people, and you know may randomly become a sick person. A healthy person can get really sick really fast, um, and you want to be covered for that. Right, so you're not unhappy to pay for other people who have had some bad luck compared to you. Um, you want to be able to talk about ways in which these two problems can be addressed through certain policies. I think that's a really that's another category of sort of thing you want to be comfortable talking about in like an essay. Um, and then we talked a bit about um, so a lot like so there's a lot of like the empirical work in this area. Um, I made a few notes on here um, about like the Rand experiment, the Newhouse uh, study, which used the Rand experiment. Um, to argue that technology may have been a bigger driver in cost growth. So we're familiar with that. And again, just a couple sentences. To be able to say in a couple sentences what each of these studies was finding. Um, the Atlas Project, right, finding differential rates of cost growth in Medicare um, and why that maybe suggested that Medicare wasn't itself the problem. Um, so uh, that was, I think, a homework question as well. Um, and then the Finkelstein paper, which was finding Medicare as a bigger driver of of growth. So she argued that Medicare actually encouraged technology development, which itself drove up cost growth. So this interaction between the two, you can't look at them separately necessarily. Um, and then the Oregon um, uh, uh, health experiment, and kind of understanding a little bit about why it was compelling or why these randomized experiments can be compelling, um, I think is important as well. 
Um, and then, of course, you talked a bit about Medicare, but you're probably sick of talking about Medicare after the memo, but um, you kind of want to review that, uh, uh, that material as well, what you wrote in the memo. Um, would be helpful as well. So that's kind of the health area. And again, most of this is conceptual, which is an overall point I made on Friday. A lot of this material for, the se for this course in particular, but in the second half of this course especially so, it's much more conceptual in nature. Um, so the test tends to be a little bit less analytical in terms of drawing graphs and shifting things around than 101, and certainly maybe even more so than the midterm. Um, okay, so the next category, um, um, with unemployment insurance, I'll just abbreviate that to UI. So I just wanted to make a, n a couple of notes on uh, on this. Uh, so we talked a bit about um, sort of some of the reasons why universal. Uh, sorry, this so we talked about some of the reasons why um, unemployment insurance may have benefits for the individuals who are covered. Um, so one key point is uh, the consumption smoothing benefits of unemployment insurance. So the idea is when you lose your job, we want your consumption drop to be not as, as, as steep. Right? We want it to be that you can keep your rough, you know, your rough like, lifestyle without really dramatically cutting into like, important expenditures in your life. Right? So the, uh, we don't want it to be the case that you know, um, if this is like your expenditure or your consumption, and this is like time, but like when you have a job, you're kind of, you know, you're, you know, you're spending this much money per month, and then suddenly you lose your job and you drop down to here, right? That like suddenly you have no extra money, you're living paycheck to paycheck, and then when you lose your job, you have just very little savings to rely on. We want it to be the case that this is a little bit smoother, so part of the way that works is let's make people who do have jobs pay a little bit. Well, basically, you know, to get, insure themselves against the bad state of the world. So you kind of lower very slightly the uh, earnings of people who have jobs, right, in the form of like, uh, uh, you know, UI taxes. And then you make it such that if you do lose your job, you get a check from the government. So instead of, you know, be having a sort of higher dropping all the way down, you're kind of going from a slightly lower initial point to a slightly higher um, second level of consumption. So we're smoothing your consumption over time. That's why we say consumption smoothing. And that's the goal of, of unemployment insurance, as is the goal of almost any kind of insurance. Right? It's supposed to just smooth the ups and downs of life. And that's, this could be like a state farm ad, right? Like, smooth the ups and downs of life, right? So you can think of that ad where like things fall on people's car. There's like that actor who just plays things and destroy things. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, and that, what that's saying is, you know, Weird. I mean, that's supposed to scare you into buying insurance, which I don't like. But um, it is sort of saying that, like, when bad things happen, you want it to be not as bad, right? And the way to get that is by paying a little bit when things are good. Um, so that's a consumption smoothing benefit, and that's a very important benefit from unemployment insurance. So when we think about the welfare effects of unemployment insurance, like what are the good and bad things about unemployment insurance? This is a good thing, right? Because people are risk averse, so they they prefer, you know, closer together to further apart even if the means dropping a little bit from this high, this little difference in money is not that significant. As we know, diminishing marginal utility of money, right? this small amount of money, at a, when you're in a very wealthy state anyway, it doesn't have a lot of value. But this amount of money, when things do go wrong, has a lot of value right? because of diminishing marginal utility of money. So if you can frame it in that way, that's like the economic way to frame um, this story, rather than just saying, you know, I want people to be OK and be happy. I mean, like, that's OK. Um, but the economic argument is about marginal utility of money. And like the marginal utility of money when you don't have a job is really high. Right? You suddenly start thinking about money. An extra $5 make, make, means a lot to you when you don't have a job versus when you do, an extra $5 doesn't mean much. So you want to shuffle money from the states when it doesn't mean as much to the states where it means more. And that's going to increase overall welfare. So that's a, a welfare improvement uh, benefit of, of unemployment insurance. There is a, there's another question about duration, though. So, Before oh, yeah, go to sure. duration, um, mm -hmm. we talked about in class, like, the percent crowd out. Um, can you go around and calculate that? Yeah, so the crowd out question, if, um, I don't remember the exact frame that she put on it, so maybe I can come back to this, you know, individually, but um, I think what she was saying was that, like, so to a certain extent, individuals prepare for this already, right, by setting aside money in their savings, um, or by, you know, setting up a range with their family, or whatever, they have informal ways, uh, forms of insurance for unemployment. One of them is, is savings, 
right? So this, the, the, the positive effects of this consumption, form of consumption smoothing in the form of like a formal unemployment insurance program <coughs> is, is like sort of diminished <coughs> if by having this program people change their behavior such that they save less, right? And maybe they don't have as many informal arrangements uh, for insurance. Right, so there is crowd out in the sense that, like, okay, if we're smoothing consumption in this way, that's actually keeping you from doing what you would have done to help smooth on your own. We're actually not having as much of an impact as we think we are. So, like, for example, like we we are here assuming that before you would have been the blue line. Uh, let me actually put different colored lines so you know what we're talking about here. So the blue line is what you kind of would have done. Um, in the absence, of, or what we're assuming was the situation in the absence of insurance, and the red line is kind of like here's this new policy we're passing, right? That is going to smooth your consumption. But what if you were already? There's no added. There's no third color. Is there a black one up there? Or a green one? Or blue, blue and red. All right. Oh, blue and red. Oh, it's just blue and red. Okay. Don't worry about it. Um, so, but if in this state of the world that we don't really observe necessarily because we passed this law and now we're in the kind of red, we've got this red policy. Um, maybe in that blue state of the world, you would have actually saved this money and set it aside for when you do become unemployed. And so actually we were already in the red state of the world. Like you were already doing that automatically. You were saving more, but now the government passes this law that says we're going to kind of compensate you when you get unemployed. And you're like, oh, I don't have to save anymore. Or I don't have to have these informal arrangements that'll make sure things are okay for me later. So by having this whole elaborate unemployment insurance system, we may just be fully crowding out informal ways of insurance that people are doing anyway. So to calculate kind of the percentage of how much we're crowding out, you'd need to know that in the absence of this policy, or at least try to estimate it in some econometric way, in the absence of this policy, how much would, would your consumption have dropped, right? Would it have been this blue amount here? Um, well, there's good reason to believe maybe it wouldn't have been this huge consumption drop. That maybe you've taken care of it a little bit already. And that you're setting aside some of that money, so you're actually only making this in the absence of policy. And if, you're, if you did lose your job, you might actually not be all the way down here like we think. You might be kind of up here because you've set aside some of that money, or you've got family who can help you out, or whatever. So, to some extent, this is the drop that we actually have, and we reduced it to this, which is good. But we thought we were reducing this to this. So that's a much larger effect. So you can use the fractions by which we're reducing it to roughly estimate the crowd out. Right? That we, we think that we're going from this is the current state of the world to here. We're actually going from here to here. So it's a much smaller drop. So kind of the gaps. And, and you're never going to have to do this. I, I really don't think you're going to be computing crowd out um, like on the test. But it's more like conceptually, you want to be able to talk about what's going on. Right? Is that like uh, um, this is a much smaller decrease. What's the counterfactual? It's really like API 202 thinking, right? In the absence of this policy, what would have happened to your consumption uh, when, you, when you lose your job? And that's something you're going to estimate using data. But in terms of the actual percentage calculation, I don't think you're likely to see it just because you've never had to do it before. Um, yeah, so how would crowd out be related then, or how would, I guess, it have to do with kind of expectations? Like if, if you're unemployed for years and years and you had only saved enough for you know six months, or all the rest of your family is also unemployed, so they can't. Yeah, so you. so I think this is almost more of like a um, targeting type of like, or who are these different people, mm -hmm. right? Because there, you know, there may be some people like this is one representative person, but I'm sure there's a lot of people who don't have any informal insurance avenues and can't really save. Actually, I know that there are many mm -hmm. people. I, um, we all know that that's true. That there's groups of people who live paycheck to paycheck. They can't save anything because they just don't have enough to save and they don't have family connections who are reliable and formal insurance providers. Mm -hmm. right, so they actually have no option. So they are these people who are like just, just getting by, and then when, if, if they lose their job, they're going to be in big trouble. Mm -hmm. So unemployment insurance is more likely to have an effect for them because the counterfactual is, in the absence of unemployment insurance, they're going to take that big drop when they lose their job. Like they're going to be have a hard time making ends meet. It's like that whole thing you hear in presidential debates. Right? That is that person. The problem may be more like for people who are doing okay, mm -hmm. right? Unemployment insurance may not help them as much because they have these other avenues available to them. So it's, it's so this is a good point that you raise that we may be more concerned about unemployment insurance for the groups of people who could probably handle some of it themselves in the absence of a formal program. Um, but unemployment insurance is quite likely to help with very little distortion 
more of the people kind of at the bottom. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't quite put that like directly in here. It's more like a how do we disaggregate like the effects. Um, and there seems to be less discussion about employment insurance for like lower um, ability or lower like not ability, it's not the right word, but lower sort of um, socioeconomic connected people or or you know people who are in, you know sort of low lower income groups. Um, okay, so I, I wanted to point so that really un, like uh, unemployment insurance is about these trade offs. Right? This is a good thing about unemployment insurance. The duration effect may or may not be a bad thing. Right? And we generally kind of categorize that as a bad sort of moral hazard effect with, with a caveat that we'll talk about, which you, you're all probably sort of, sort of familiar with as well. So duration. So the issue here is that in the absence of unemployment insurance, again, you want to think about the counterfactual, how long would it have taken people to find a job? That's, the, that's kind of the, the, the first counterfactual you want to think about. And then in, in the presence of unemployment insurance, it's, it's almost certainly going to be the case that it will take people longer or that's certainly what the data suggests, that it'll take longer to find a job when there is an unemployment insurance system in place. So there's a lot of people who try to measure that elasticity. So this is another example of an elasticity in the real world, right? Is that what is the elasticity of duration with respect to benefits? Now, you're probably not going to be calculating that on your own, but it's important to conceptually understand why that's an important thing to ask. Because if we double your unemployment insurance benefits, how much longer will people stay unemployed? What is the percentage change in how long you're unemployed, divided by the percentage change in your benefits. Benefits double, how much longer do you stay unemployed? Is it a big elasticity? Do you stay unemployed way longer and enjoy your benefits? Or do you want to stay unemployed just a little bit longer? Right. So that's an elasticity that people who study this are very worried about in the sense that to some extent that could be a moral hazard situation. Right? That we are giving you more benefits and that's enabling you to sort of be lazy and not, not seek out a job because you can get by okay. Right in the in the absence of looking for a job because your paychecks from unemployment is are, is pretty good, right? So people who generally are more wary of unemployment insurance, the economic argument they're making is that the elasticity of duration with respect to benefits is pretty high. Right? The moral hazard of unemployment insurance in that it keeps you from looking for a job for a longer time. It kind of like subsidizes. I don't want to say you know, all these terms are very loaded, but like subsidizes laziness, right? That like it subsidizes people to just not look for a job. Um, so there's two, so that's kind of a downside argument on the moral hazard side, and we'll talk about like how should we process that given the benefits we know exist in unemployment insurance. Uh, first of all, uh, so just to repeat, people who are against unemployment insurance argue that the elasticity of duration with respect to benefits is high, and that there's high chance of moral hazard. Right, and, and, or, and that, again, you don't have, we probably not going to have to compute any of these, but it's more just understanding the, the notion that if we raise your benefits a little bit, you're going to stay unemployed way longer. That would be a big elasticity. And that's kind of saying, and that is an, a, a, like that elasticity is like a measure of moral hazard to some extent. Because right? why are you staying unemployed longer? Um, and we'll talk about that as well, like some possible other arguments uh, later. Yeah. So when you say raising benefits, you're also speaking to the increasing the duration, right? Or is um, it just sort of... It could be either one. So you could, you could look at like the uh, benefits as like a per week benefit, or you could look at it as like how many weeks of benefit you get. Um, and generally, if you look at graphs, um, you know, uh, if, let, me raise it here. Um, let me change this graph around a little bit. You want to be able to sort of um, think through the logic of something like this, right? So this is like weeks unemployed. Um, right, and this is like your, um, so I think, did we, did we do the hazard rate graph? Did she do that in class? Do you guys remember? Was there a graph of like the hazard rate? Or did we talk about this concept? Let me just quickly introduce the concept. So the idea of a hazard rate is sort of like, how many people find, uh, uh, you know, I, I think she did mention this, like how many people find a job conditional on them being unemployed at this point, right? So. So uh, again, I think this will be easier when we actually have uh, the, the lineup here, but it's sort of saying, if you've been unemployed for a week, what are the odds that you find a job in that first week? And so what's the probability that you find a job in that week, given that you've made it a week unemployed? And then uh, when, you know, for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, et cetera, it's just going to be, okay, given that you're unemployed for four weeks, what is your probability of finding a job in that week? Right, so that's what we're going to plot here. Right, so um, what you often see is like, well, a lot of people find a job pretty quick. Right? And then it kind of drops off for a while, 
and sort of the presumption is in the absence of, uh, of, of unemployment insurance, maybe the line would look something like that. Initially, you've, you, know, these, you really find a job in those first few weeks, but if you're unlucky enough to be like really deep in unemployment, it becomes really hard. So conditional on you being unemployed for like 30 weeks or whatever it is, let's, let's make this 100 weeks. If you made it 100 weeks unemployed, your odds of finding a job in week 101, pretty low, pretty low probability. So this is like in probabilities and percents, right? So that's maybe what we expect in the absence of unemployment insurance. But usually what we see is when we pass unemployment insurance and we say, you get unemployment insurance uh, benefits until this week. This is like the cutoff week that we don't give you benefits anymore after this week. So this could be, let's just say 70 for the sake of argument, right? 70 weeks, you get unemployment insurance benefits. After that, you don't get benefits anymore. So what happens to the line? Well, we generally find that the line kind of spikes up kind of right at this point, right? And then kind of drops back down. Right? So people find a job pretty quickly after their benefits run out. Right? So there's a couple of ways to interpret that. Graph. And again, this is a rough estimation of real data. This actual graph exists, and I think it was in our slides. Um, so you can go back and, and, and check for that. But what this graph is saying is basically, wow, it looks like a lot of people find a job right after their benefits expire. So one argument could be, those people were all just bumming around and doing nothing until they really were faced with having to find a job, right? Because they weren't getting benefits anymore. And so that's one argument. Does someone think of one argument for why this may actually not be as compelling evidence that people are being lazy when they have unemployment? Yeah. Well, it could be that they were looking for a job that really fit their skills and their level of education, those sorts of things, and they had no other choice at 70 weeks but to... Right, so like where are these jobs? Like, yeah. What are these jobs that they're taking? Are they taking like good jobs for them, or are they taking jobs that aren't a good match for them? There's this job match issue, right, that like... Well, here, yeah, okay, fine. Like, a lot of people do get a job real quick after their benefits run out. But maybe it's because they were like those really low-income people who had consumption smoothly, like a huge drop in consumption. And they, like, were at home and they were like, look, I'm not going to survive into next week, food-wise, unless I do something. And I was looking for a reasonable job. I'm an accountant. I was looking for a reasonable job. I'm just going to go work at Walmart because, like, I need money. Like, I need to be able to pay the bills. And the unemployment insurance was helping me do that. But in the absence of it, I'm actually in serious trouble. I need even a tiny amount of income. So you can test this. You, you, you can kind of like look at the data and test how you know test this effect. How long do people stay in the job that they get after their duration, after their benefits expire? Um, what, how good is the match for them, etc. So there's ways to try to test it, and there's different empirical results on the extent to which this seems to be a job match issue or more of a moral hazard issue. Like when you take the moral hazard away, you change your behavior dramatically. Um, or the moral hazard causing behavior. So some people may argue this suggests moral hazard instead of suggesting a job match issue. Yeah. Could you also say the opposite? I mean, I agree with what you said, but um, could it also just be that that's the right amount of time that it takes for someone to find a job? Um, well, then, uh, so that, that's true. It could just be that this is the natural mm -hmm. progression anyway. Um, but just if we assume this blue counterfactual line, Okay. Right, which is sort of the assumption of people who are alarmed by the red line. They're like, well, if you didn't have this, this policy, it would look like the blue line. Which you're kind of saying is almost, um, the blue line looks more like the red line than this graph shows. That maybe 70 weeks is like the cutoff week. And that there's, a, there's somewhat of an argument to be made there, because why did we pick 70 weeks to begin with? That's what I'm getting. Right, so maybe we picked it because that's when we knew people needed, <coughs> needed it until then. So there's like kind of a a whole cart before the horse like thing going on. There's like a cyclical kind of thing. We've seen a lot in this class, right? Is the policy perfectly tailored to the counterfactual that it would have existed anyway, or is the policy changing people's behavior in a way that we'd be worried about or happy with or whatever, right? So understanding the trade-offs and being able to write about them is key here. Well, yeah. do we see the location of the spike change when we change unemployment duration? Because if it changes if to 99 weeks, the spike changes, then... See, now you're thinking like an unemployment insurance economy, which sounds really boring. But yeah, so that, that, would, be, uh, um, uh, that would be something you would look at, right? It's like when we, so for example, when um, the president, right, increased the, the amount of time people were on unemployment, you could actually observe that data. I, I don't know 100% on it, if anybody's looked at the more recent one, I'm pretty sure that the spike moves. That doesn't prove that that's a, it may, may you know, say that your argument is maybe not as compelling. But it doesn't necessarily prove that if we have moral hazard, it maybe just kind of implies that there's something that we should look into there. Because the job match thing still becomes relevant, and the consumption smoothing thing is still there. Like maybe people are just taking a job 
for, just to take a job um, because of the smoothing issue. It's maybe just a little bit off, but why don't they do a phase out with this, like the other thing we talked about? Um, like a f so, yeah, like so, a, d a decrease in benefits as yeah. you get further in. I think uh, I don't know. We do that here. I think maybe some states do that. I'm I'm not 100 percent sure on, on how it works. I know some countries do that. Uh -huh. um, some countries do phase ins, and the idea is actually that like maybe in the beginning you've got savings to cover you, but later we're actually going to phase in more benefits because if you've been unemployed for like 30 weeks, like you're probably really having a hard time. You, you know, you, it's going to be harder for you to find work, and given that you've been unemployed for that long, you probably have no savings left. So, like, we are actually going to phase in benefits. I know a lot of countries that do that, and the benefits can phase into like ninety percent of your previous salary um, in some countries. So, there's a lot of people who look at data from other countries and find like very strange results. That like in some of those countries where the phase in is like gets you up to ninety percent, people still take jobs, like. You know, it, so there's kind of a cultural thing going on too. And why is it the case that in countries with really high replacement rates, which is the percent of your previous salary that you get, why do those countries um, see people who actually find jobs? Like, why would you even bother finding a job if there's like 90% of your salary is being paid for you to sit at home? But people do in some countries, and to an extent that they don't really do in America, even though our replacement rate's not as high and all these things. So something else may be going on culturally. Um, as well. Yeah. So when the Congress is extending the, uh, I guess the, <clears throat> the number of weeks the benefits are paid out, is the assumption that they look at the data and say, well, there's a systemic reason why people are not getting jobs right now? It's not that it's not because you know 20% of the country is lazy. It's just because there's a recession, or some other reason that they assume you know they deem more important than. Yeah. So the justification hazard. for for moving this line this way, even if the bump does move along with the line would be sort of a consumption smoothing one, right? So the economy is actually having a hard time. A lot of people have lost their homes. Their, even their savings have dropped dramatically because their savings was all in the market. And the market kind of went down quite a bit. So that may have actually cut into their savings that they had available to them anyway. Um, so that's a big issue. So this consumption smoothing problem becomes more dramatic during a recession. And then also, maybe, the, maybe these lines like have moved down because of the recession. Like it's just, for anybody unemployed, it's just much harder, right? Which would be kind of just these lines have just moved straight downwards. Like your probability of getting a job, given that you've been unemployed for six six months, used to or six weeks, used to be here. And now it's a much lower probability. It's just because the recession is hard to find jobs or whatever. So, yeah, these are all possible reasons for moving moving uh, you know, the benefits outward. I think these are all kind of again debate conceptual debates that you want to be able to have. The trade-off here is important to understand. Well, there's the smoothing benefits on one side, right? There's this duration worry about moral hazard on the other side. And then there's this kind of interaction about, well, well maybe it's a job match story, and right? maybe there's these other things. What about like the disaggregated effects, right? So like, um, who are we talking about here? Like, who are we worried about? Where is the distortion coming in? Well, we're worried about people who could have found a job easily anyway, but chose not to because they're sitting at home. That's the concern. So it's those people that are causing the inefficiency in the system, not the people who are consumption smoothing or whatever. So how do we identify those different groups of people? So you just want to be able to talk about these trade-offs, like that there's good sides and bad sides to unemployment insurance, and then understand sort of how this connects to like um, the insurance stuff we talked about more generally. Like people want to move resources from the good states to the bad states because they have more value in the bad states. Money matters more when you don't have it, um, so you're happy to give up a little bit of it when you do have it to be guaranteed um, to have it when when things go wrong. Yeah, I don't know if this is something we should table, but um, knowing that there's a that uh, income mobility is something that, and, and the people's interest in raising taxes is not necessarily something that many people support who are in lower um, income brackets. Is there, but it seems like unemployment insurance is actually really popular or something that people find to be positive the way that social security is. Is there a relationship there? I think that's interesting how it's so different. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, because so, so the, the you, you mentioned the, like the hypothesis, 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 right? Yeah. Right. So this prospect over mobility hypothesis, the idea that like I may get rich later, so I don't want you to take my money away. Um, yeah, uh, when it comes to me, when I when it comes to me being rich later. So part of it is just sort of a behavioral thing, right? It's that like when I cash in later, I don't want you to steal. So the, this hypothesis, it's just a theory, right? Um, is kind of premised on like people don't want redistribution. Um, if like the you know the wealthier state of the world is later maybe I don't know, for some reason 
they're worried about you taking their money if they get rich later. But if we're looking at like unemployment insurance, we're kind of maybe looking at people who have a job now, don't want you to take some of their money now, right? Um, and transfer it over to people who, who don't have a job now. There's maybe some behavioral reason why, like, when we flip that, right, the bad state and the good state has been flipped. Like, why is it the case that people, you know, I actually, you know, I wish I had an answer for that. Of, like a ten year old, but like uh, uh, that's a good that's a good point. Like why are, why would people why would those two how would those two be consistent with each other? Because to some extent they're not really. Right. Because you're moving in the proof I bought this case, you're like not willing to move money from, um, or or you don't want to sacrifice money in the rich state. But there's also this issue about insur There's one added element of this, which is this insurance aspect. It's like you're moving money from the rich your rich state to your poor state, whereas the proof I bought this is is not. It's going to give you money. Sort of in your in your poor state, right? Um, but it's not necessarily direct one for one. Like unemployment insurance is a little more concrete, <laughs> right? Like we're going to, you will get this amount of money if you become unemployed, and, it's, and it makes people feel a little bit more at ease. Whereas the proof hypothesis is more like I'm going to take a lot of your money if you become rich, and you're probably not going to see much in you know if you're poor right now, like in terms of redistribution. So it just feels like the bigger amount of money is like the is a negative thing. Right versus like with unemployment insurance, the big amount of money we're talking about is the big check you get if you're unemployed, and that somehow resonates more than a little payment or little amounts. I don't know. Maybe okay. that's the reason. Mm -hmm. that I'm so. just kind of brainstorming. But this is a, a good question. I never really thought of. It. Is that really tax benefit linking? Maybe. Like, um, is there more yes. connection to the immediate response? You value it differently? Yeah. So I, I would be aware. Like it's conceptually similar. Okay. I would be wary about using the same because tax benefit link is like is a very concrete thing. It's like there actually is like the benefits you, yeah, exactly. Yeah. When you pay a tax, there are benefits coming to you and it's exactly proportional to like your tax amount you in some way. Like yeah. This is more of like a conceptual like benefit tax link. It's not like a, con like with Social Security, it's like if you pay an extra thousand dollars in Social Security because of your income, you're entitled to more later. It's actually like a one, not necessarily one for one, but it's like there's a formula that connects the two. Um, whereas this is, you're, you're right to think of it as a similar conceptual idea, um, but not, it's not necessarily like one for one or 50% you know, for one or whatever it is. Um, any other questions on like unemployment insurance or anything like that? We want to again be able to talk about these things, write a little essay about these things, um, be able to talk about these concepts and what, what are the good sides and the things we might be worried about about unemployment insurance. Um, okay, then we talked about state and local government. Um, so there's a few things there. The, the primary thing, I'm going to erase this here. Um, the primary thing was, uh, or the first thing we talked about was the TVU model. So state and local. So the key assumptions of the TVU model um, are that, so we're assuming that people have full information. And our mobile. I'll come back to there's a third assumption as well, but let's just look at this. So people have full information. They can move to any town. The TBU model is kind of saying, well, there's different kinds of towns, right? There's some towns that have, and again, the terminology they use is sort of odd, but they refer to it as amenities, right? So you can think of different towns have different levels of public amenities, right? And that may be, I mean, you can look out the window, right? It's like how nice are the streets, right? How nice are the parks? Are they maintained well? Are there enough parks? How are the schools? Are the schools maintained reasonably well? Is the standard of teaching reasonable? All these things that the government is providing, public goods in a sense, right, could be really good or really bad in a certain town. And usually that's pretty closely linked to um, local tax rates, right? local, state, um, property tax rates, which pay for a lot of these things, in some cases directly, like schools, right? So if you, you know, you graduate school and you decide to move to a certain town, the logic of Tibu is saying, if you had full information and you were fully mobile, you can go anywhere, you're going to find the town that's the best fit for you, right, in terms of the amenities that they offer. And you know going in that if the amenities are nicer and you value that, you're going to have to pay more in property tax for that. Right, so in other words, this natural sorting mechanism is going on whereby people are choosing the town that fits them best and that has a property tax rate that's commensurate with how good of a fit it is, right? So you may say that, okay, look, I don't have any kids, I don't plan on having any kids, but I really like to jog, right? Or I like to ride, I like the outdoors. So I'm gonna look for a town, if I have full information and I'm fully mobile, 
anywhere in my like general area of interest. And it could be like it doesn't have to be like anywhere in America. It could be like I'm going to DC. What neighborhood am I going to live in? Right? Am I going to live in Arlington? Am I going to live in DC? Am I going to live like in Bethesda or whatever? Um, well, I'm going to find the area that has the best fit for me in terms of property tax rates and then the amenities that the public public is going to public government is going to you know give me in that in that area. You might also think about rent, but rent is is sort of a private side. Right? That's a private. That's cost of housing. That's kind of a, a on the private side of things. So we, we'll, we'll kind of leave rent aside. We're going to kind of hold rent constant here, which I know is not really the best way to do this analysis. But we're we're focused on what the public government is bringing to the table, right? Or what like the local government is going to provide. And I'll pick the place that has the best amenities for me. And if I like the outdoors and I don't have kids, I don't care about the schools. So I'm going to find a town that has bad schools but really nice parks and outdoor spaces. Right, that's where I'm going to go, and a lot of people who are just like me are going to go there. Right, so suddenly, the fact that we have all these different, different, different kinds of locations will pull in similar types of people to those locations who are willing to pay that local property tax to, to compensate. Right, so in an area like that, schools aren't very good, the property tax may not be as high, um, they just need to cover the parks expenditure or whatever, which is not nearly as much as another area which might have nice parks and nice schools and nice everything, but you don't want to live there because the property tax rates are too high for you, right? So people self-sort into the neighborhoods that fit them best, and then the property tax rates go along with that, or the local tax rates go along with that. And if people are, have full information and are mobile, this model will, will do a good job of sorting people and, and aggregating people's preferences, which is the issue now, right? Like if I need to provide public goods in Cambridge, well, there's so many different types of people in Cambridge. What do I provide? This model saying, no, there aren't so many types of people in Cambridge. Cambridge draws in people who like Cambridge's public amenities, including a school system. I, I, the school system here is pretty good. I don't know. Um, people with kids may, may know this more, but I, my sense is that it's a pretty good school system. Parks and public services are pretty good. So this is probably drawing in a lot of people who value that because property tax rates are pretty high here. Like they could live somewhere else. They could live a couple towns over, but they chose not to. And that suggests that they don't mind paying the higher property tax rate. They want this kind of thing, so a certain type of person lives in Cambridge. And a certain other type of person lives in, you know, Somerville, and a certain other type of person lives in Lexington or whatever it is, right? So this is, leads us to the third point of the question, um, which is that there have to be sufficient jurisdictions. And by that, I'm, uh, I'm basically saying there have to be enough towns. So another presumption of this model is you can't have like two towns. Um, so why specifically would that be a problem in this model? Well, if you had just two types of towns. And you're going to have a lot of like random people in each of these towns. Like, there's just Cambridge and Somerville. There's only two towns that we have. And let's say Cambridge has better schools and better parks. Somerville, not so good schools, not so good parks. But what if you kind of like schools, but you didn't really like parks? Where are you going to live? You can choose Cambridge or Somerville, but now suddenly the sorting mechanism is not as good. Because like somebody who likes parks but not schools has no place that's perfect for them. They have to go to Cambridge or Somerville. They have to pick one of the two. There's not sufficient place for them to go. So the sorting doesn't really work out, right? You'll kind of, you'll get some sorting, but it's kind of messy a little bit because you have random people who like, what are you doing in Cambridge? Like, the yeah, property tax rates are really high, and you don't even have any kids. They'll say, look, I, I like parks. Like, I gotta pay the extra property tax rates here. There's no perfect place for me. There's no town with nice parks, bad schools. Um, I'd love to go there and pay a lower lower tax rate, but I I can't because there's no such place. So you don't have sufficient jurisdictions. It's a limitation to the effect of this model on like doing a good job of sorting people in the right place. So that's the basic idea behind TVU. And of course, um, I, no, I'm happy. To, why don't I take questions on this part of it um, first, just like the basic setup of the model, and then we'll talk about some of the implications. Yep. So I just want to make sure I understand. When you said that you are holding rent constant, that's because, um, well, well, yeah. Why are you holding it? Yeah. So the so the rent is a tricky thing because. Um, Rent is like a private sector interaction, right? It's like you are renting from a landlord, and that's a private interaction, and yeah. it's you as a private citizen, and them as a private citizen. But the TV model is focused more on the public side interaction, you interacting with the local government, which is on the property. T like, well, you, it's weird to think about it as a sense of you're paying for something when you move into an area, but you sort of are. You're paying for the local public services, and you're paying for lots of private things, too. But I'm not. We're not inter interacting with you as a private citizen. We're interacting with you as a public, uh, as, as sort of a member of a, of a you know, sort of an area that's ruled by a government. So, um, to that extent, we're just focusing on the public side. 
and not the private. But you're right that like the rent will matter too, but we're just kind of lumping that in with the private. Oh no, it's fine. I didn't know if you were talking about people who um, owned versus rented. Because if you go to a place like um, New York or Boston where there are a lot more renters, um, how do you make sure that their um, interests are being represented by this kind of a model if they're not actually investing and paying those property taxes? Yeah, so that's a good that's a good question. I mean, the assumption here is again also that like if you're a renter. You're paying some, you know, um, time adjusted part of the property tax okay. and through your rent or something okay, like that. That's helpful. Maybe something yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's a little bit hand wavy. I know, but like that's kind of this model is really like a very simple model of sorting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it there's again like you know we've talked about models all year. It's not really a perfect reflection of the world, but it, it's like a subway map in the same way, right? It does a decent job of kind of showing what's going on, and I think. I find it somewhat compelling as a, not that it's a good thing or a bad thing, it just, it does seem to s s mirror what a lot of people do. The fact that people ask, like, how good is the school district here? I'm about to have a, my kid's about to be five. Right, that fundamentally says that people do think about things in this way. They do think about, like, the quality of the amenities, and people talk about property tax rates, and, oh, they're so high here, but the schools are good. So, you know, that, convers the fact that conversation happens suggests that this has some explanatory power. Even if you're right, there's like these kind of areas where we're hand waving and making some assumptions, <coughs> um, which is the criticism of the model, right? Is that it maybe it doesn't do a perfect job. These assumptions are pretty strict. And then there's even some other ones that are smaller assumptions, like yours, um, or the, the one I've, I mentioned that may be unstated. Yeah. How does this work if some of those public goods are open to people who are from outside the town? Like if I live in Somerville, but I can use the Cambridge parks, why would I pay? Yeah. The parks? Yeah. So I mean, you know, I think that this is again sort of assuming that they're unique to the person, like the town that you're in, like that you would only use the ones in your town. Okay. It muddies up the model a little bit if you can like go to a neighboring town. Um, but presumably, like the inconvenience is enough of a factor to suggest that maybe you might go to a neighboring town to their park sometimes. But if you live right on the park, and that was like you know you probably go there every day or something, so maybe it's not too much of a concern. But you're right, that's like another thing is that we're assuming like kind of walled in communities where there's like very little inner you know, crossing of borders. But for education, it's not as big of an issue, and so that's an issue for some of the amenities, but not all of them. Okay. So there's a couple other things to talk about in this uh, model. So the first one is um, the implications for redistribution. So what's the, what is sort of, um, if you're worried about equity, what would be your concern here? But there aren't sufficient jurisdictions. So there aren't jurisdictions. So there aren't sufficient jurisdictions, kind of. It's more about like, it, even if there are, we may have a problem, an equity problem. Yeah, so this would kind of suggest that, like, who's going to be in the Cambridges and the nice places with nice schools and nice parks and everything? People who can pay. And who's going to be in the place with the bad schools and bad educations, et cetera? People who maybe can't pay. And this ties back to, all the way back to the demand curve. Remember, the demand curve is not just what you are um, willing to pay, but what you're willing and able to pay. That's the definition of, of you know, the, what underlies the demand curve, basically. Uh, that, that concept, that is what demand is, what you're willing and able to pay um, for a certain good. And here the problem is the ability to pay. Right? So maybe you really value education, but you're not able to pay it. You're not going to be able to live in a Cambridge because you can't pay that property tax, right? um, even if the rent was the same in Cambridge. You still wouldn't be able to live here because of the property tax. So um, that's, that's an important equity consideration. And that may lock people into cycles of poverty and kind of lock in sort of social superiority in the higher socioeconomic class groups. Right, that like they're guaranteed to do well, their children are guaranteed to do well because they get to go to good schools, because their parents can afford to take them to places where the schools are good, et cetera. Right? So this is a problem you've all probably at least thought about at some point in your lives, um, um, maybe not thinking about it through an economic model context. Right? Um, so this is a, a big equity issue um, with this model. Um, so we want to think about like what does this world look like, and maybe the Tibu world is not if this is a strong explanatory model, we have to deal with this, right? If this actually is what's going on, even to a certain degree, we have to think about like how do we handle this in terms of the equity of it. Um, we talked about a couple things in class. We talked about school finance equalization. I think I put on the sheet, and I don't remember if we talked about that this year because I missed this class, but the financial aid targeting and take up, I don't think we talked about yeah, financial aid this year. I think she had to cut that because of the shortness of the class. So I'll take that off the sheet. Don't worry about it. Um, unless I'm, unless I'm, uh, so I wasn't there for this particular lecture. I was out of the, uh, uh, out of town. But um, I don't think we talked about financially this year. Sorry, I forgot to erase that from last year. 
I just realized uh, um, this morning when I was looking at this over again. Um, so if that's the case, we didn't talk about financial aid, go ahead and cross out um, the second line. I'm sorry? Um, no, no. Um, so yeah, so the school finance equalization idea, um, so the key point there is that, well, if we tell a certain district you can't spend more than $10,000 per student, Right? And that's a way that we, we think we're going to try to decrease the inequity. Right? So we have certain districts where the school spends $2,000 per student, and other districts where the school spends $15,000 per student. The rich districts get $15,000 per student, or maybe the poor districts get five dollars to $2,000 per student. So we don't like that. We think it's really unequal, and we're like, look, we're going to make it, a, a, you cannot spend more than $10,000, and if you want to, like, you can, but then you have to pay like a tax to the federal government who will then pass that money on to the poorer spending districts, right? So what would be the response to that kind of policy from the rich districts? What do you think they would be more likely to do? You'd only spend up to that cap. Right, you kind of cut your spending. You may, at least a little bit, have an incentive to cut your spending because now like spending above the cap is going to cost you double. So why would you spend that? It gives you some disincentive, maybe not complete disincentive, but some for spending that much. So you're really just going to make the wealthier, sort of higher education districts spend less, and that'll limit the amount that you actually collect from them to pass along to the poorer districts. So you may have good intentions with this policy. We're going to collect money from the high spenders, give it to the low spenders. But through the sheer fact that that's the policy, you'll have less high spenders, so you'll collect less money to give to the low spenders. So you really will be hurting the good school districts more, this is again the argument, You'd really be hurting the good school districts more than you'd be helping the poorer ones get better. Right? So that was one, uh, you know, one argument kind of against that sort of a model, um, which is a pretty prevalent. Again, not it's not exactly like the system I described as a simplification, but like that kind of mentality of let's equalize school spending may not be the right way to do it, especially at this broader level. Of, like we're going to have this community redistribute to this community. Maybe a better way is to say, look, look, we actually need to redistribute in some way from the wealthier people, people to the poorer people not community to community, and maybe that's not the level of analysis we want to be, or the level of redistribution we want to be doing. That's one argument as well. So kind of thinking about how you can fit in redistributive equity into the, into the consideration. Again, I don't mean redistribution in that strict definition of taking money from a rich person and giving it to a poor person. I mean fundamentally like creating equality of opportunity to be that simple. Right? Currently it's unequal, the, the, uh, the opportunity, and we want to equalize it in some way. So there is some redistribution involved in like, creating the structure so that the structures are equal across um, areas. So yeah, I mean redistribution quite broadly. Yep. Sorry, could you explain? So you're saying that we should reconsider framing redistribution from an individual perspective instead of a community perspective? How does that actually solve any of the problems? How does that solve it? So they could. Sorry, go ahead. Then if you redistribute among individuals, then they'll be able to the theory would say, have the power then to move into a different community. They'll like have the buying power to move into the community with a better school. Right? So right, right. So you take so money from the rich parent and give it to the poor parent. So right, poor but, but, parent but maybe not directly, maybe in the form of tax policy. No, right? It could be a different, it could be a policy not even about schooling. It could be just raising tax rates on the wealthy. Right, and creating more like like programs to support unemployment, you know, boosting up unemployment insurance. That is a form of redistribution that focuses on the same problem of the rich and the poor having really different opportunities. Mm -hmm. But it's not framed as like we're going to pull down the quality of your education. And, and I think this point that that um, was just raised by Aaron is another good one. There's this idea that like, okay, if you if you're wealthy enough, you should be allowed to move to a district that spends a lot on on the quality of students. But by redistributing through like an income tax policy, we don't. You, the money that you get to keep at the end, you can go to that district. Like we don't want to make it such that there's no district that spends more than ten thousand per student. Because what if like a billionaire is around and just like, look, I want to go to this like super ritzy district. Um, we don't want to like make that not possible for him, but at the same time, we want to acknowledge that like he's got a lot more opportunity. So maybe through like higher income taxes or whatever it is, we can get some of you know his actual income and and kind of transfer it in this other way. So maybe um, instead of doing redistribution from the community. Right, at some individual basis, which really we're talking about taxes at that point. We're talking about not even like going to, we're not even in the education frame anymore. Okay, but to tie it back to the education frame, when we're talking about just the income tax, you know, taxing wealthy people at a higher income rate, the income tax rate, uh, 
how does that fix the school? I'm, I'm asking you to tie it back to the education. Yeah, so, it, it, the, so what we're saying here is don't have that school policy at all. Have no policy about schools. Be okay with the TBOO framework. Right? Allow schools to spend whatever they want on their students. Right? Um, we won't have the school finance equalization at all. So it's really, I'm not even saying I'm going to fit it into that policy. I'm going to abolish that policy in this world. And I'm going to instead, because why did I have that policy to begin with? I was concerned about equity in this world. Right? Maybe if you're concerned about equity in this world, the solution is not to go into these communities and force them to change how much they spend on things, change the quality of their amenities. So once, one way to, to kind of jump into this is kind of say, I need to make the amenities equal across communities. Right? But what I'm saying is maybe that's not a good way. Just let the, leave the amenities alone. Let communities decide for themselves. But instead, target, like, if you're worried about equity, target it in a different way. Like, just don't focus on making the school spend less per, per student or anything like so that. So you're creating equity for individuals. In, sorry, everybody. I just don't understand. So you're creating equity between individuals. And now, the lower and the more, they must on tax base more disposable money. If they really want, they can send their to more places for them to have a district. So this means that inequity between schools will be sustained. Yeah. So I mean, here you're you're saying I'm okay with inequity between schools, okay. but what I'm trying to get rid of is the fact that like if you're a lower income person, you maybe have now more ability to move to a different community, right? So we're really worried about the case of a low income person who really values education but can't pay for it, right? One way is to say, well, we'll transfer you money from rich school districts. Another way is to say, look, we're going to transfer you as an individual in some through some policy or whatever, more money that may be lowering your taxes when you raise them on the rich or whatever. It doesn't have to be a direct transfer. But we're going to, exactly like you said, increase your disposable income. You can then move to a, a, a community that has good schools and bad everything else, if that's what you value. Now you have that opportunity to do that, um, whereas you didn't before through the distribution. Yeah. That doesn't take into account, though, that like people can't find new jobs, maybe, so they have to stay within that? So they you yeah, it's not, it's not perfect, but it, the fact is that like if you have a little bit of it, okay. it'll, some, it'll open up that possibility to some people. Okay. Right, so I'm agreeing with you. It's not going to be like everyone's just going to be able to up and leave, yeah. right? Because there's still this assumption. Mobility, yeah. I'm assuming mobility, right, in this okay. framing. But you're right, maybe that might be a bigger problem. So you're I still realize. assuming all these things, but then now we're putting that. Right, right. right. Or, or to the extent that these things are not true, that will okay. dull the impact of what we're talking okay. about here. So it's not so much that like you have to assume all of these things to have a conversation about this. It's more like if these aren't totally true, it becomes like a, a fuzzier proposition. Like these, all these ideas, maybe there's not as much movement. There's a lot more inelasticity in people's decisions. Like they, they stick with where they are or whatever for, for reasons that are related to this. There aren't enough jurisdictions. There's nowhere to go. Right? Maybe there's nowhere to go. Maybe they're not fully mobile. Maybe they're tied to their community. Right? Maybe they don't know where to go. Right? And that, these, if these things are made more flexible, there's more inelasticity, actually, um, in their decision. And they may not be willing and able to move, even if they do have, like, another neighborhood better. They can't leave theirs, because none of these are true. I don't know. So that's one, one possibility. That's a good point. Yeah? I don't know this is an important thing to distinguish now, but it seems like with the TBO model, um, that to a certain extent, people accept that it's real, it exists, even though there are flaws in it, but that when we're talking about the school finance expenditures, that there's a greater consensus around the fact that there is a problem in equity around that model, and that it's not necessarily fixing the problem. Is that true? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure I totally unfollowed your, like the question in there. So I agree with what, what you said, okay. um, what, which is that the school finance equalization is like focusing on this inequity in, in education. But it doesn't really do a good job. Um, yeah, it's just, it's like, it, you may have, like, the desire to deal with this. It's just kind of saying one way to deal with this may not be as good as it initially sounds. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really just an, it's a thought exercise to help us, like, understand why sometimes there's policies that are intended to deal with the equity problem, yeah. but may not do as good of a job as you think. So you want to think through, if you're a policymaker, you want to think through, like, sort of the economic implications of any given policy, even if you may have good intentions, but you may end up just sort of doing harm. Right, really, all, you're not going to help any low-income people. You're just going to hurt wealthier people, which is making it more equal, right? The Gini coefficient of education, in some abstract sense, is going to, you know, go down. But as we've talked about, Gini coefficient going down is not good enough. Right? Just being more equal is not good um, if the people on the bottom aren't being helped out, aren't actually being made better off. So um, I, I'm not sure I totally followed the, the, the question there, but I think that we, both of the statements you said 
seem to correct me. And then some of the theories that were introduced to um, from the beginning, we see the pros and the cons to them, and others I feel like there's maybe a little bit more heavy critique in how when you follow it through it doesn't necessarily uh, satisfy, and it seems like with the school expenditure that's an example of one where there's more consensus around the fact that it doesn't really carry it. Yeah, and again, I, you know, I think that, yeah, we're, we're holding that up as, as like a, a policy with less merit. There's one thing we're assuming there, which is a responsiveness. So, for example, if schools are inelastic in their spending on student per pupil spending, which is a reasonable argument, well, we're locked in, like we spend this much per student. If that's the case, then maybe school finance equalization actually would work, right? Because when we put in this kind of cap, we say you can spend above the cap, but you have to pay some of it. If you continue to do what you were doing before, right, that's actually exactly what the point of the policy is. So if that is the case, then maybe it's not as bad of an idea. So I don't want us to just be totally destroying all these policies. It's quite a prevalent type of policy. Um, so maybe it might make more sense in a neighborhood where, or in neighborhoods where adjusting the amount you spend per pupil is not actually that easy to do. But if it is, and you know, we can see big changes from year to year, then it might not have much of an impact. But at, yeah, as you pointed out, there's always trade-offs. There's like, you can find an argument that why policy might actually be not as bad. It's more just like, it's not all, it's not necessarily going to work out that way. Um, okay, why don't you keep moving so we can talk about um, NPV here, um, cost-benefit analysis and all that fun stuff. Um, okay, can I erase all this stuff? So, key idea uh, for uh, NPV. Um, so let me um, here. Actually, you know what? Let me actually use years. I'll make this 2013. quickly kind of put up an example, maybe we can just um, talk through through that and, and try to talk through the concepts through the example. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up like a hypothetical project which has some benefits which I'll put in blue and some costs which I'll put in red. All right, so I don't know, let's say it's um, um, Improving like road, you know, like like um, repairing like potholes and improving roads in a certain town. All right, so um, the benefits, you know, it's actually kind of annoying in the beginning. You don't really get a lot of benefits because it just clogs up the roads. Like they have to have all these, you know, they shut down certain roads and it increases traffic. So there's costs in the short run from that. There's also costs in the short run from the fact that like you got to pay the people to fix the potholes. So there's a lot of costs up front. So I'm just going to put, you know, 10 million this year. And then there's some repairs that have to be made next year, so it's another five million. Um, and then just some small maintenance uh, changes maybe you have to do, or you have to hire a manager to oversee this in the long run, or whatever, right? So there's some costs um, that happen in the future. I'm using M here for million, right? So um, everybody kind of agree with me here that the costs are more upfront when you do something like this, because it includes also commuting costs for the poor people living in this area, who suddenly roads are closed and there's just more congestion. So there's lots of costs. Um, the benefits, there's really nothing in the beginning. There's not much benefits early on. The benefits come later when the roads are smoother, congestion is less bad, people can get places on time, less accidents, so forth, right? So we somehow have some way to estimate all that, um, and maybe the benefits are like 10 million um, per year, and then they start kind of petering out. Um, yeah, right, so maybe 10 million, let me say 10 million, 8 million, and then 2 million. Just to, from being really jarring drop. Right, so the benefits are really going to kick in here. The benefits kind of start dropping out here because maybe the roads start getting bumpy again. Right, they, they just sort of naturally do that. But in that second year, like, boy, the roads are going to be really, really nice. People are going to be able to get to work quickly. No accidents. Less expenditure on hospitalizations. Less expenditure on, um, you know, judges who have to oversee people who are fighting about the accident that they had, or whatever it is, right? This could be a lot of things lumped into the benefit side, like why does the government fix the road? 
uh, at all, there's clearly some reason why they're doing it and people like it, right? So everybody kind of okay with this as a basic setup? Okay, so the key idea behind cost-benefit analysis or, or NPV, it's not as simple as saying, well, there's benefits and there's costs, and let's just like add them up, right? So a large number of people will just sum these up. And so they'll be like, oh, 20 million in benefits, 17 million in costs, like, let's do it, right? To and I'm not saying people in this class, I'm saying like people in the world, right, will do this, right? Um, and in this class, right? Like, but after they watch this video, they're never going to do that again, right? But people in the world will just sum it up. They're like, what's just total benefits, right? And they'll say, well, let's add these rows, you know, row these columns together. Um, people are busy with other things. They don't really want to do more, more nuanced analysis than that. But having come to the Kennedy School, you know that we have to do something else, which is that these benefits are in the future, and for various reasons, we need to think of them in present terms. Right? It's really hard for us to actually think about costs and benefits when they're spread out over the, over the near and, and far term, because things that happen, and this is the basic idea behind present value, things that happen in the present feel like more. Right? So $10 million now has more value than $10 million next year. Right? Things that happen in the future are, are like discounted more and more. So you can think about like the impact that something has is whittled away by some percentage every year. So every year you go into the future, things get positive things or negative things get whittled away by you know some X percent every year, right? Because they just don't matter as much, right? Winning the lottery when you're not you know in, in 50 years would not impact your life as much as winning the lottery now. Right? It just, for various reasons, some of it is interest rates and all that kind of financial stuff. Some of it is just, like, it's now. Like, it just, it'll impact me more if it's in the short run. I'm impatient, and there's other things about me that are, that are, that are, that are critical, right? Same thing at the government level, right? Things that happen, you know, the costs and benefits now for the government are things they have to deal with. It's like, it's, you know, it's, it's up front, it's right there. Um, whereas things in the future are more abstract, lots of things can change before that happens. Maybe like we don't even reach these years. Some you know some horrible catastrophe happens, or there's a big federal program to improve the roads that could change all of these things. Right? They could totally. They're just estimates, projections forward. So these I'm like not as sure about. Um, but here you know so so but that's a whole other story. We're going to assume here that we're pretty much sure about these. But you may factor that into your discount rate. Your discount rate may say things in the future don't matter as much because I'm more unsure about them. Even though we have an estimate of two million and one million, eh, they you know may not be as certain. Other policies may really change the dynamic. So, um, so we have to bring everything to the present. We have to have a way to directly compare the costs and benefits from a given policy. So what we're going to do is we're essentially going to take all of these future values. Here's the present, right? This is us in the present, and we kind of make a big dividing line. We want to bring everything that's not here here. We want to pull all these numbers to the present. So that literally means pulling this th here, we need to bring this here, we need to bring this into the present. And same thing on the, on the cost side, we need to take all of these costs and bring them to the present. Right? Um, so how do we do that? Well, the nice thing is that it's the same thing every time. For every one year you're pulling things back, you have to divide by 1 plus r. Like r being the discount rate. Right, so for every time you pull one of these numbers towards us, to the left, you divide by 1 plus r. So if you're doing it, like for this 2 million, you're bringing it back 1, 2, 3 years back, you divide by 1 plus r three times. In other words, you divide by 1 plus r to the third power. Right? And people sort of follow that? Mm -hmm. right, so that's all that future value, present value, all those formulas that people, I think, maybe over-focus on. Um, is saying. It's saying something that hopefully you want to build the intuition on this week. There's a, look, every time you pull it back, I need to divide by 1 plus r, and we'll talk about why um, uh, next. But does everybody kind of get what we're trying to do here, first of all? Okay, so why divide by 1 plus r? Um, well, this is kind of the, the, the intuition that I think helps the best is to think about interest rates, right? Why is, let's look at this 10 million in benefits. Why would I divide this by 1 plus r? To get, bring it to the present. Well, that would be well, what happens when I do that. It'll become 10 million divided by 1 plus r. That's presumably the present value of that 10 million. Right? Why is that the present value? Well, think about if I had this much right now. If we think of the, about the interest rate idea, the discount rate is similar conceptually to an interest rate. Um, 
if I had this amount right now and I put it in the bank, what would it become next year? Mm. Well, you have to multiply it by 1 plus R. That's what the interest rate kind of is. Right? So 10 million divided by 1 plus R now becomes 10 million next year. Therefore, 10 million next year is equivalent to having this much now. Right? Oh. The present value of 10 million next year is by definition equal to the amount of money I need now to have 10 million next year. That's the same thing, right? I can, if, basically, in one case, I'm offering, I'll give you this next year. In another case, I'm, I'm telling you, I'll give you this now, and it'll become that same amount next year. Those two things are equivalent. Right? So that's the key idea here behind why, why are we dividing by 1 plus r for every year? Well, because if I move in the other direction, I, can, I get to multiply by 1 plus r. That's what an interest rate is saying. Yep. Yeah, so it, that, that's, 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 that's you're saying, what you're saying is the same, <coughs> uh, same thing as what I'm saying. It's just that you're going from present to future and multiplying by 1 plus r to the t, okay. and I'm going and dividing by 1 plus r. But what you said is fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, but so, so what you're kind of saying is like, you know, 10 million now times 1 plus r, uh, times another 1 plus r, times another, but I'm just dividing it by 1 plus r to the t. But the same logic is true. Like, actually, the two things you said are equivalent, I think, there. Um, okay, any other questions or anything? Okay, so everyone's all right with this why we're dividing by 1 plus r every time. Right? So the first step would then be let's do that for all of these projects. And every time we bring them back a year, we'll divide by 1 plus r. Or in, you know, the, the formulation that Perissa was emphasizing as well is totally fine, which is that it's two years in the future, so I divide by 1 plus r to the 2. Right. Either way is fine. So we're going to have a 10 million divided by 1 plus r. We're going to have an 8 million divided by what? 1 plus r, so r, squared. One plus r squared. squared, because it's two years in the future, or because I pulled it back two years. And what about the 2 million? What am I going to have there? 1 plus r to the 3. Right. So there we have the three different benefits pulled back into present terms. So I can add all that together and I'll have the present value of the benefits. Like this plus this plus this and presumably add there's some R. I'm keeping it at R right now. But usually R would be given to you here and you'd have to just compute this. Um, again, for test purposes, you're unlikely to get like, here's 30 years of, you know, because you'd be on a calculator for like two hours, right? You're probably going to be given, like this would be the extent to which I think the, I mean, the upper end of how many numbers you'd have to compute. But if I told you R was 0.1, you could just pump it into a calculator pretty easily and, you know, resolve <coughs> them. So you have to do each of these separately, correct? Like, you mm -hmm. can't, I know this is silly, but you can't, like, add them and then do no. it by 1 plus r to the third. No, okay. because this, because if you add them all and then do by 1 plus r to the third, you're saying that 20 million are benefits are here. Okay, gotcha. Right, but that's actually not true. Some of them come earlier, okay. so you need to factor them in separately. At the right? different rates. Yeah, yeah at the, discount them at different rates, because it, that's a great question, because a lot of people will do that. Yeah. Like, there's 20 million benefits and they stop in three years. So we have to discount for three years. Well, getting 20 million in three years is worse than getting 10, then 8, then 2, because at least I get some of it earlier. Right? Yeah. You could, though, take the net in each year and divide by the net. You could, yeah. 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 yeah, so that I'll, I'll come back to. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, to answer your question. Yes. Um, so I'll do the same thing here. Um, these, these, I'm going to bring the costs back. Notice that I'm keeping the cost for now in positive, like positive. I'm not putting a negative sign in front of them, but they're red. So red, we know that that's like a negative thing, right? So um, hopefully everyone's okay with this. Five million divided by one plus r. That's one million divided by um, one plus r to the two, and then another one million divided by one plus r. But now it's to the three. That's the final number. And so those are my three benefits. And I should mention we're adding in the ten million of present costs, that would be a part of the total costs. All right, so one, two, three, four terms for the costs, one, two, three, four terms for the benefits, one of which is zero, but still technically a benefit of zero. Um, and we can then compute the present value of the benefits and the present value of the costs given any R. All right, so if you look at the spreadsheet that I posted with my section notes, which had the, for that sample problem that we did in section, where we looked at in section, um, that's what the spreadsheet is actually doing. It's pulling all the benefits back by dividing by 1 over 1 plus r to the t. 
Um, okay. If we do that, so let's look at what we have. Right, so there's a few different ways that we've talked about computing benefits and costs in a benefit cost analysis. Right? So one is NPV. So what is NPV? It's this plus this plus this plus this. Take all the benefits, add them up in present terms. All the things in blue here, add those up. Subtract out all the things in red because these are costs. So present value of all the benefits minus the present value of all the costs. Right. Again, if you kept, if you did costs with minus signs in front of them, you don't have to do, you know, like a you don't have to make them minus or anything like that. You can just add them all together instead. You don't have to have the minus sign. It doesn't have to be this minus this. You can just sum them all up. These are, but costs should have, I mean, do whatever you prefer. But if you just remember, like costs are negative things. Like when I do an NPV, the costs have to have a negative sign in front of them. They have to have, be negatively impacting NPV, whether it's negative outside of a bracket or negative in front of each term. Um, they should all be negative, but I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, so that's NPV, just adding all this up effectively, right? But with a minus sign for the cost stuff. So that's NPV. Benefit cost ratio is saying add up all the benefits and then add up all the costs separately. Again, keeping positive signs. And divide all of these, the sum of all these, by the sum of all these. So don't just like do this minus this. Do these divided by this. Is everybody following me there? All right, so instead of doing, so if, let's say the sum of all these, I'm going to call it A. I don't know what the, what, what the summation of all those is, but you could do it, right? If I gave you an R, you could come up with the sum value of all the present value of uh, benefits. And I'll call this B. In other words, this is the present value of costs, and this is the present value of benefits. Right? Um, it's probably confusing. Let me just stick with this. Let's call this present value of benefits. Sorry, forget the A and the B. I just realized that that's way more confusing and a stupid idea. And not doing stupid things was my New Year's resolution. So, not too bad. Sorry. Um, so, the present value of benefits is all that stuff added together. The present value of costs is all that stuff added together. Um, so, NPV is this minus this. Benefit cost ratio is this divided by this. It's not really uh, nearly as complicated as they sound. They're very similar. Um, Concept. So what's wrong? So why not do benefit cost ratio? Anyone remember? What's the problem with the benefit cost ratio? Wasn't it one for the relative term and the other one's an absolute term? Right, so NPV is absolute because I'm adding everything together. The problem with benefit cost ratio is imagine I have two projects. Um, we put, uh, can I put it on the, I'll put it on this board here. Um, so imagine I have two projects, one, and for those watching at home, I'll move the camera, don't worry about it. Um, so project one, project two. I don't know why I said that in such a snarky way. I'm like, they didn't complain because they're in the future. Okay, so project one and project two. Um, maybe I have the present value of cost, present value of cost for this project. Oh, wow, we have camera people. Thank you. Whatever, they're at home. They're probably like barely wearing clothes. Crying <laughs> <laughs> at two a.m. Um, okay, so project one could have a present value of benefits, which is a dollar, and a present value of cost, which is like a penny. Right? Like, it's not really a big, impactful project. Project two might have a present value of benefits of one billion dollars, and a present value of costs of be like seven hundred million dollars, right? So, with NPV, which project has a higher NPV? Two, and it's not close, right? NPV of this project is ninety-nine cents. NPV of this project is three hundred million dollars. So, if you only could do one of these projects, which one would you do using NPV? Project two, and it's not even close, like a wipeout, right? What about benefit cost ratio? What's the benefit cost ratio of this project? It's one divided by 0 0.01. It's just this divided by this. That's 100. A pretty high benefit cost ratio. What about this project? It's like 1.42, mm -hmm. right? Something like that. Um, 
So that's way worse than this in benefit cost ratio. So your boss would then say, do that one, right? But your boss would be an idiot, right? So you should definitely do project two. It has way more net benefit um, uh, to society, right, than, than project one. I'm, your boss not an idiot, but he just needs to get an MVP, that's all. Um, so NPV, in terms of like the size of the pie, so somebody asked a question, I think by email, about NPV and Calvert Hicks and all that stuff. NPV is fundamentally about, uh, is there someone in this room? Yes, okay. Um, NPV is fundamentally about like the size of the pie, right? Projects that have bigger NPV make the add more to the pie than other projects, right? Um, so we are saying here that what I care about is the net difference between benefits and costs. So I want to make the pie as big as possible by accumulating as much as possible of absolute difference between benefits and costs, right? So this, the benefit-cost ratio analysis doesn't do that. It's a relative measure. But what we care about is the size of the pie in NPV, um, and making the size of the pie as big as possible means pursue the project with bigger NPV. Um, always, right? Always, yeah. Now, the assumption in this analysis here, because I've been in dollars the whole time, has been that uh, we can move this back over. Sorry. Um, thank you for your help. I'll make sure no one is on camera. Ooh, it's kind of dim looking on this board, but that's fine. Um, so uh, the assumption we've made so far, we're just talking about things in dollar terms. Benefits are in dollar terms. Everything's in dollar terms. Um, but there's no sort of distributional analysis built into this at all. right? So who gets this money? Like, who gets the billion here? And who, gets, who suffers the $700 million cost? Who gets this dollar? Who gets this penny? I didn't say anything about that. right? We haven't even talked about that. So we talked then about like waiting, a weighted NPV, which is to say maybe the people who lose the 700 million here are people we really don't want to suffer, right? This may be like, you know, big corporations with like greedy fat cat uh, people who are in charge who get the billion, and this may be like, you know, low income people who actually will suffer a lot because of a $700 million cost that they have to incur. Right? So it could be the case, actually, that maybe this project is actually better than this one. Because this one hurts groups who have a very high marginal utility of money. Specifically, maybe lower income people or something like that. So a distributional analysis using NPV may actually put different weights on people. In the same way that we use like a utility function to turn dollars into utility, you could actually use like kind of weights to turn these dollar amounts of costs and benefits into like a weighted cost and benefit. Right? So maybe we want to double count the present value of costs here because it's hurting low-income people. And we think that like a dollar of damage for a low-income person is like doubly bad. Right? In, in which case, the NPV of that project on the right becomes much lower than even 99 cents. Right? So I shouldn't do that project. So you could easily ask, like, um, you know, see a question like, you know, how big of a, of, a, of a weighting would you have to put on these costs if this is like low-income people, all these costs? to make this project worse than this one, right? So you, you would want to think about like, how, well, what percentage would I have to increase this to make this plus this equal 99, this minus this equal 99 cents, right? I mean, that's a, you're not going to see a number with 99 cents, but um, that's the kind of thing you want to be able to do to at least get a sense of like, you know, what, what, uh, um, what we would do if we wanted to think about equity in the context of NPV. Um, Can you repeat that statement? Like, what well, we'd have to do again? Yeah, so, so how would we figure out, let me make this, these numbers work a little bit easier for our purposes here. So it's, instead of saying a dollar and, nine, and, and um, uh, a penny here, I'll say the present value benefits is two and one here, and just so we don't have to deal with fractions. So if I wanted to ask, like, how heavily would we have to weight these costs, this, these dam let's say these damages from this project only, these are going to hit low-income people. Right, the 700 million project is going to hit low-income people. So... Why don't I one more time? Sorry. Um, so I'm now going to assume here. Um, sorry, I'm stuck in the way. <laughs> I can't get out. That's all good. You're a star. Okay. So uh, uh, so these costs and only these costs are borne by low-income people, and everything else is borne by like the, an average citizen be like fixing the roads or something, right? I don't know. Um, so how bad would these, or like, like how much would we have to wait, um, low-income people, for us to be indifferent between two projects? Right. 
So well, this one in, using NPV, right? So this one is an NPV of a dollar. And so we want to ask, well, how much would we have to weight these costs to make the NPV of this project a dollar? Right? Well, by definition, I would need one billion minus this to equal a dollar. Right? So I need 700 million to be scaled up such that 700 million times something will give me enough to make this minus this a dollar. So I need one billion minus 700 million times x to equal a dollar. Right, that's going to be when, you know, it, we'll, I want to find the value of x that makes this equal to 1. And that's just something you can plug into a calculator. Why are you doing it equal to 1? Because I want to know when this project is just as valuable as this one. Just as. Okay. Yeah, that's like, when, when am I indifferent, or when does this project become, how much would I have to wait these people to, like, reach that cutoff point? That would be an indifferent. Yeah, so that might be a useful analysis. For example, I may not know how much I want to wait low-income people, but I know... Like, if you tell me it's like 30% more than right, an average person, I know that's not enough, or I know that's too much. Right? I mean, but maybe I don't know the exact amount. Like, I don't know that it's 26%, but I know that there's some amount that's too much and some amount that's enough, and I'm, I have like a sense of it. And this is a good like, first step. Right? So, how much weight would we have to put on these low income people for us to switch over to project one? And this is the cutoff point. And actually, it's much simpler to calculate than it than, you know, may have initially sounded, right? Because you have a number, a number, a number, and an x. You have one unknown, you have to solve for x. So you have to move all the dollar terms to one side, and the x by itself to the other side. Right? So this is like all the way back um, to like, you know, sixth to ninth grade or whatever it was. Um, so you move this amount here, you move the dollar over to this side, you'll have like, this is in dollars, okay, so you'll have one billion minus one, one billion dollars minus a dollar equals 700 million times x. Right, and the one billion minus a dollar is not fun to compute, but it's like 990, you know, some 9999, lots of nines, which you can approximate as like 99, actually I'll just write it all out, but no. Like this, divided by, right, that's this minus this. That's like 999 million, blah, 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 all the way down to there, divided by 700 million. Right, equals x. So when you do that division, you can plug it into your calculator and solve for x, and that will tell you it'll be one point, I mean, you can roughly approximate what it'll be, it'll be roughly like 1.4 or something like that, um, and that's going to be your value of x. Basically, I'd have to weight low-income people here at like roughly 40% more than high-income people for me to be willing to switch over to project one and no longer like project two more than project one. Um, so again, that's the kind of thing you want to be able to do. We haven't really done it on problem sets and stuff like that, but I know she mentioned it in class. I think one of my sample NBV problems does that, but I'm not 100% sure. I think that's the case. So if uh, the posted sample problems might be a good place to check out if you're still not 100% on these things. Um, but there are extra sample NBV problems if you're not aware. Um, there's, the, there's some in the practice exam, but then there's more in a separate document uh, posted on the course site. Um, I think that covers most of the... NPV. I mean, we also talked a bit about like valuing costs and benefits um, and stuff like that. Actually, I did want to talk about um, the expected utility, certainty equivalent, that stuff. So I'll talk about that last. But I just wanted to quickly touch on um, a couple other points, which is um, the value of statistical life um, as well, right? So um, one important consideration when you're doing this kind of analysis, we're talking about costs and benefits as in dollar terms, but they may themselves not be accurately expressed in dollar terms. Right. Um, so there's things about the costs and benefits of certain things that we can't really capture in dollars. So I'm reminded of this, uh, how many people watch the West Wing? I'm always reminded of the West Wing. But there's this, uh, you know, when they have the presidential debate between, like, uh, the two candidates, they have this discussion about, basically about uh, non-use value, right, where one of the candidates, they're talking about Anwar, and the candidate says, you know, oh, it sounds like a beautiful place. Like, have you ever been there to the other candidate? And the candidate's like, no. And then he says, well, I haven't either. Has anybody in the audience ever been to Anwar? And he's making the argument that, like, the non-use value is, is irrelevant, right? He's saying that none of you have been there, therefore you can't value this particular thing. But So he's arguing there is no non-use value. But somebody may disagree and say, look, I actually get benefit from just knowing that it's there. 
and uh, I never interact with it. I never interact with anyone who went there. I never watched a documentary about it. Like, nothing. Right? There's no value at all to me. I never get any utility from it in terms of an actual physical enjoyment of it or the effect that it has had on other people. I just, like, I like that it's there. Um, and I'm not trying to trivialize that, that feeling. Um, but I'm just trying to say that that is non-use value that we have to somehow give a dollar amount to, and that you can imagine how hard that is. Right? So we're more just trying to highlight these points to kind of get you to think about the costs and benefits that we're talking about in dollars here and really realize, and I know the professor makes a, does a pretty good job, I think, of emphasizing this point. Um, not that it's non, not, not that it's not important if those things matter, but it just makes this analysis harder. So it's good to know the things that you're putting dollar tags on may not be fundamentally in dollar units. And so you want to think about um, how you're valuing those costs and benefits. Are there some questions? It look like there's some people who want to chime in. Yep. Um, so you started with the value of the civil life, and then you were just talking about the non-use value. Um, did, did we, like, close out on the value of the statistical life? Oh, yeah. So the value of statistical life is just an, a, a, another example of something that we put in dollar terms, but it fundamentally is like a person's life. So. Like, it's not comfortable to put it in dollar terms, right? But it's just another example of a thing that's not measured in units, right? not measured in dollar units, that we have to convert to dollar units, but we, and we have to pick something, right? Um, and my, my favorite example for this is the speed limit thing, right? Which is that, like, why do we have speed limits? Well, because if people go really fast, they're going to crash into other people and hurt, hurt each other. Right? Higher speed limits usually means more accidents and more deaths on the road. So how high is too high a speed limit? Like, you got to set something. You can't just be like, I don't want to set a speed limit. It makes, me, it makes me uncomfortable thinking about how much a life is worth. Well, by choosing something at random, you are making that assessment, right? You, like, fundamentally, we can calculate if we raise the speed limit how many more people are killed. So by doing that, you are doing a cost-benefit analysis, whether you like it or not, and you are placing at least conceptually a value on a statistical life even if it makes you uncomfortable, and it should, because it's a life, it's not really in dollar terms. My life is probably worth some amount in some actuaries table, but to me, it's like super expensive, I think. <laughs> um, and to my family as well, and so how do you figure out, the, you know, so it, it's more just kind of throwing that in there as an example of how it's hard to value costs and that. On your practice exam, you had that one question, though, on the value of statistical life, where you have like someone going on one vacation versus another, and in one, it's like, I don't know, it's like a eight, million out of 10,000. Maybe you can say the example, but I wasn't, I didn't have, an, I didn't really understand the answer to that one. Can I didn't understand it either. Okay. Yeah, so it's usually, um, so I, I don't have the exam in front of me. I can just talk to you guys individually on it, but um, the idea is basically calculating expected value. Like, we are, again, we're talking about costs and benefits here, right? So to figure out, like, the, the value of the statistical life that's assumed, you have to do, like, an expected value calculation. Um, so rather than go into that specific problem like right away, I kind of want to talk about the expected utility, like that whole framework, just because I think that'll yeah, be more right. generally valuable. And then we can, I mean, we can come back to it. That we can make that the last okay. thing, um, just because we have like 20 minutes. So um, why don't I talk a little bit about um, just like that expected utility model? And feel free to just hold that question out if you have a copy of it. That'd be good. I just don't remember the numbers yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So last thing. Um, before we technically wrap up. So I'm going to, I guess, stop with the more formal presentation-y thing at 6, um, at which point I think I'm going to go down to the study, and I'll hang out there for an hour. Um, so if you want to join, that's fine um, for office hours. Then I have more time on Wednesday. Um, the exact time period is, is escaping me at the moment, but it's on the course site. I think it's Wednesday afternoon. Um, yeah, it's certainly Wednesday afternoon. I just don't exactly... Um, and then there's some other office hours as well from the CA, so check those out. Um, and tomorrow morning, of course, with the professor during the class time, um, she's available. So, um, all right, so just really quickly on um, all that certainty equivalent and st stuff. So we talked a bit about um, how we can incorporate certainty equivalent when you have uncertainty during a cost-benefit analysis, right? So it may not be so simple as there's going to be two million in benefits and then there's going to be three million, et cetera. You may have like some uncertainty around the costs and/or benefits um, of a given of a given policy. So we want to think about something called a certainty equivalent. So we'll just quickly talk about um, what that means. So I'm going to put utility on this axis and dollars on this axis. All right. So 
Um, we, we want to understand the relationship between dollars and utility. Let's start with that. So clearly this is an, a, a positive relationship, or the assumption we're making is that it's positive, and I think that's a reasonably compelling assumption. I know a lot of people are like, more money doesn't make you happier, but you can believe that that's true and still agree that there's a positive relationship in the sense that maybe you're saying that later, when you have a lot of money, more money doesn't make you happier, but certainly when you have nothing, more money would make you quite a bit happier, right? So you are actually arguing, um, not necessarily, you're not really making the case that this is not upward sloping, but in fact, you're probably making the case that it has the shape that we're actually going to talk about it having. Um, so, uh, and, and another thing economists will always say is that you may actually say, well, more money actually make you less happy. Economists would say, well, then you're being really rational because why don't you just give away some of that money to charity or hand it to, like, your best friend or something? Because that will give you less money, it'll make you happier, and it'll make your friend happier. Right, so why wouldn't you do that? Or why wouldn't you give it to charity or give it to someone who is in need? Um, so that's how economists usually make the argument that like people who think that this starts going down eventually are are kind of just trying to stir up trouble, and it's not necessarily um, a believable argument. Um, so okay, we're gonna just anchor it at zero. So if you have nothing, you get no utility, um, and then we're gonna have a shape that looks like this, where it's steeper at the beginning and then it gets flatter later. Right, so the slope of this curve is, by definition, the marginal utility of money. Right? So it's steeper at the beginning because these early dollars have more value. I move one unit to the right, I go higher up on the curve, meaning that the marginal utility of that dollar, which is how much more utility do I get when I get one more dollar, is large at the beginning. The slope is large at the beginning. The slope is, by definition, how much more utility I get, the rise for a one unit run in dollars. One more dollar, what's the rate increase in utility? Right, so it's steeper at the beginning, it becomes flatter later, because when I get a dollar, when I have a lot of dollars, I don't value it as much. Right. Um, so this shape will, uh, will bring us to risk aversion, and we'll see why that is in a minute. Um, but this is actually a risk averse utility function. And we'll talk about why when we start bringing these other concepts. So I'm just going to do a simple thought exercise where um, I'm going to flip a coin, I'm not actually going to do this, nor will I pay anyone anything. Um, I'll flip a coin, and if you get heads, uh, you don't get anything. You get zero dollars. If you get tails, you get a million dollars. So we're going to go with that example. It sounds awesome, and I emphasize we're not doing it. <coughs> so you will either get a million dollars, you're going to get nothing. Right? So, right, so for starters, I might want to know um, what's the expected value of this game? I'm going to call and refer to this as a game, as the game. All right, so what's the expected value of this game that we were playing? Expected value. 500,000, right, 500,000, half a million dollars, right? Because half the time, if you did this over and over and over, you'd converge to an average of $500,000, yeah, you know, in value. So if I said we're going to play this game a million times, this would be, like, really exciting for you. Um, but you would earn, on average, 500000 per game. So the expected value is like the midpoint on the x-axis, right? 500,000. Right, that is our expected value of the game. So I'm going to label that EV. Right, so expected value is 500,000. So now we might want to say, well, what's the expected utility of this game? Because the expected value is not really what matters. I want to know, like, how happy does this game make you feel on average? Right? So you might say, well, let me, let me do some calculations here. I'm going to convert the dollars into utility. So what you're telling me is half the time I'm going to get zero units of utility. Right? Uh, let me put there on units here. So zero utility. And half the time I'm going to get whatever this is. Let's, let me just call this 100 units of utility. Again, I can make up whatever number there. Uh, you can always scale utility up and down. Um, so I'm just going to make the scale such that it's 100 up there. So you get 100 units of utility. So this calculation is the expected utility of this game. This, again, is expected value. I'll make this V a little bit sharper. It's expected value. This is the expected utility of that same game. Right, and it's it's what, what total amount of utility? 50, right? Half of zero plus half of 100 is 50. Everybody with me there? 
the, the expected utility from the game is 50. And so you might say, well, how is that any different than this, right? It's, how, it's like the midpoint here. It's the midpoint here, too. Fine, that's true. But if I draw that over, you'll find that that point is somewhere here, right? It's not like on this curve. Oh. Right? So um, one way to depict where that point is is to connect these two points like this with a straight line. I'm going to label these points uh, A here in the bottom left and B up here. Which, and, and to say that, well, look, I'm going to the middle utility value, just like I went to the middle x value. By definition, this point here is the midpoint on the line. And it's also the midpoint level of utility as well. So this is that 50 units of utility. Because this line has a constant slope. So if I'm going half the way over, I'm going half the way up along this AB line. Everybody OK with that? So I'll label this point C. And what this is saying is that this game, where half the time I'm at point A and half the time I'm at point B, gives me an expected utility represented here by point C of 50. Right? So now I might ask, well, forget this game. Let's play, let's play a different game. I give you half a million dollars and the game is over. That's the game. Right? Um, so how much utility do you get from that? Where would I go on this graph to, to find that point? On the curve. So it's, it's, it's on the curve, right? It's on the curve at a value of half a million dollars. Right? So I would, you know, the second game, I would go like this, and that would be the utility I get. Right? By definition, this game is just saying, look, I'm giving you half a million dollars. This curve tells me the relationship between dollars and utility. So at half a million dollars, that's your utility, period, right? And so this could be, I'll give this a, uh, a, a amount. But you can see it's between 50 and 100. So I'm just going to call it um, 80. But it could, be, it could be anything, but it's clearly between 50 and 100. And I'll label this point D. Right, so what are points C and D showing us? So point C is the expected utility of the game, the flipping the coin game. D is the expected utility of the other game that I suggested where you just get half a million dollars. You get the expected value. Right? Clearly, you prefer just getting half a million dollars to this coin flipping thing. You get 80 from just getting half a million versus only 50 from flipping the coin. What does that suggest about your risk preferences? You're risk averse, right? That they both have the same expected value. A totally rational automaton machine would be like they have the same expected value. I'm indifferent between those games. But people are risk averse. They don't like the uncertainty. Right? Now, one way to think about it is, and this may work for some people and other people may not, but that second half a million is worth a lot less than that first half a million is, right, to someone. If you have nothing and I give you half a million dollars, that really makes you a lot happier. The second half million, yeah, it makes you happier, but not that much more happy, right? So why would you risk the half million that you really like, right, for the possibility of getting another half million that you don't like as much? That's conceptually what's going on. That second half million doesn't have as much value Flipping the coin, choosing to flip the coin is to say, I want to get that second half million too. I don't want to play this game where you just give me half a million dollars. I'm really excited by the idea of that second half million. Right? But if you're risk averse, that first half million has like gotten you almost all the way there to like pure happiness, right? So you're like, dude, why would I risk that and take this coin flip game where you might take that half million I already have, which I love, away from me. Right? So I won't choose the coin flip game, I'll choose the guaranteed half a million. Yeah. Just really quickly, um, in your last sentence you said, why would I um, care about the second half a million if it gives me less value, um, as opposed to using the word utility? Is that uh, Sorry, less, less utility. Yeah, sorry. Does right. it matter? Uh, yes, it does. So okay. utility we're talking about on this axis, yeah. value is usually in dollars. Okay. Yeah. Because you're only going at that point from like 50 or 80 to 100, which is... I mean, you're going from 80 to 100, which is... Right, exactly. So if you give me half a million for sure, you're giving me 80 units of happiness. Why would I take a chance to get another half million? Yeah. million? They're only going to give me 20 more units and risk the possibility of losing the 80 that you're offering me in this other. So I may offer you these two games and ask you which one you choose. By choosing the coin flip, you are saying the excitement from the extra half mil the second half million outweighs the possibility of losing it all. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm choosing the coin flip. But we have to define that answer by talking about someone who is risk averse. Right, so that, what we're saying here is that this person who, you know, in, if this was their utility function, which is most people, right. they would choose the half million. 
right? So, I mean, if I put that to you, those two options, I don't know of anyone who would choose the coin flip, unless you're like a crazy billionaire who's just like, this is funny, right? <laughs> Almost anyone would choose the half million dollars. Um, and that suggests that this curve is, does a decent job of approximating uh, most people's preferences. Yeah. So D is the risk-averse option, and C would be the like risk, like risk loving. Like so D and C are reflecting expected utilities from the different gains. Okay. D is okay. the ref expected utility of the guarantee of a mi half a million. C is reflecting oh. the point that's the expected utility of the coin flip. The fact that D is above C means that you would take the guaranteed money. Okay. Right? It's not saying that one is like the risk-averse one. This is the only utility function. This line I just drew in, it's almost just to help us find, like, find point C. It's just a dotted line. It's not. Okay. okay. So 80 is more than its expected utility. Go for this, is, the absolute. this is the expected utility get, you get Guaranteed. from just getting half a million dollars. This is the expected utility you get from this game that gives you on average half a million dollars, but has a lot of risk in there, and that makes you feel bad. That risk like gives you 30 units of like unhappiness, right? Somebody might say, but the expected utility of value of this game is half a million dollars. You'd say, but, but, but I might get nothing, and that makes me, like, the risk, I don't like. I don't like it. So I know the expected value is half a million, right? That's 30 units of utility you're taking away by this risk. Just take it away. I don't want it. Um, so you could say that the certainty game gives you an extra 30 units of utility. Um, okay, that's not going to be the certainty equivalent, but you're right that if I guarantee you the money, the, the, the expect, if I guarantee you the expected value instead of making you play this game, you get 30 extra units of utility. That's not the certainty equivalent. I'm going to come to the certainty equivalent next. Okay. And so what if that D had been like 65? So then like the difference between 165 is greater than the difference between 65 and 50. So then would you want to do that? Remember, if you, if you lose the coin flip, you don't go down to 50. You go, down you go to, to zero. zero. Okay. So if this was 65, the gap between 65 and 100 is smaller than 65 to zero, mm -hmm. right? So you're you're comparing relative to 50. But I should be comparing. It to you should zero. be comparing it to the but other if, option. So if it happened that like the difference between zero, let's say like your certainty was 20. Yeah. So then, then then this curve wouldn't look like this, would it? It yeah, would have okay. to be like this. Okay. That's a risk taker. Uh -huh. So if this is concave like this, you are that that that's what we were saying. This shape means you're risk averse. Okay. This shape. Like an upwards, you know, the slope is getting steeper later. It means that the later money has more marginal utility than the early money, which means you're a risk taker. Like you're like, ooh, that second half million is like way more exciting. The first one was like stupid. Right? Like I don't really care about it. I'm willing to risk it to try to get that second one, which I value more. Which is an odd thing to okay. like. It just doesn't fit with our our perceptions of people. Of course, people do go gamble. And they go to like slot machines, and so there is some excitement value to the taking of a risk, right? Um, we all know that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's some behaviors that we can't totally explain with this model, and sometimes people are risk-taking in certain areas and not in others, and there's interesting conceptual discussions out about why, you know, risk and how people take it, but in this case, people generally would pick the risk, uh, the, the safer option and the guaranteed money. Yeah. Um, are there examples, I haven't gone through all the midterms or the finals, are there examples of, like, what type of question they might at what might be asked around a problem like that. Yeah, like I'm, I'm guessing it's less likely that you're going to have to do a computation of expected utility or anything like that. More conceptually, like, sh like know what a certain equivalent means, maybe what it is on a graph, right? I, I can imagine it being like a short answer or something like that where you're, you're trying to explain why, um, you know, uh, how insurance relates to kind of these concepts and stuff like that. So we can talk about that next. but. Uh, let me just, I'll, once I finish up, the idea of a certain equivalent and, and like how uh, another kind of thing that you could test on is how this ties into like cost benefit analysis. Um, because that's kind of where we started, where we started doing this. So I'll come back to that point. If I don't, just, you know, raise your hand and, and, and get Let me make one more point. We just have a few minutes left, so I just wanted to talk about certain equivalent as well. <coughs> I'm going to put in one more point, which is this point here, point E. So everyone agrees with me. Point E is the same 50 units of utility that you're getting from the game, on average. Everyone can see that E is left of C. Right? Nobody disagrees with that point. Given the curve shapes like this, E has to be left of C. The curve is left of point C at a height of 50. Right? So I can just put a dollar amount here. I'm going to put 200,000, let's say. And you can, again, if you had the perfect curve, you're never going to actually have to do this in terms of compute any of this. I don't think that's, that's going to come up. Um, but uh, uh, that could be 200,000 there. 
So what is point E saying? Well, point E is saying if, like, you know, we're talking about these coin flips and all these things, if you gave me $200,000, like no game, you just gave me $200,000, I'm going to get 50 units of utility from that. Right? That is the same amount of utility as the game, the coin flip, though zero or a million. Right? So that's saying if I put two options on the table, I'll flip a coin, you'll either get nothing or a million dollars, or just take $200,000. Right? You have the option of either one. This is saying you're indifferent between those two options. Right. The, the flip of the coin with the chance for the million, or 200,000 for sure. Right. So that is what that point is saying. Right. That is, in other words, your certainty equivalent. That is the, and it's really right there in the, in the term, certainty equivalent. It is the amount of money for, that if you got it for certain, it would be equivalent to this game, to this gamble. So certainty equivalent is quite literally, right, it's the certain amount of money that is equivalent to the gamble that you may be facing. Right. So that's our certainty equivalent. And notice that the expected value of the 200,000 is much less than the gain. Right. And that's reflecting that because I am risk averse, I'm willing to give up $300,000 to not have to have the risk of that gain. Right? That on average, on expectation, I'm willing to give up a lot of money to have no risk here. Right? This guarantee of $200,000 is good enough for me. That makes me feel just as good as the chance <coughs> to get a million versus the chance to get zero. Right, so that's a certainty equivalent. Usually this difference here is referred to as the risk premium. That's a $300,000 difference between half a million and 200000 That's a risk premium. This is the certainty equivalent. Um, so I, I did want to talk about cost-benefit analysis in this framework, because I think this is where this came up in class, so this is probably the lens through which you'd have to see this kind of problem. These numbers here, I was talking about you and flipping a coin and your own money, but this could be like government money. This could be like two projects. Uh, or this could be a project that may work out or may not work out at all. This could be, I mean, um, I'll use the loaded example. What the hell, but this could be like Obamacare, right? Like uh, the health care plan that, that Obama passed. Who knows how much it's going to save, right? That's, that's part of the uncertainty. It's all in the future. We have these different estimates, discount rate. We have to do all that stuff. Um, but some parts of it may just work, and some parts of it may not work as well as we think. We don't know. We have no, we have good projections. We've got policy analysis. We're trying to do a best job to estimate how much it's going to save, right? So you see you these differing estimates. It's because of uncertainty, right? We don't know exactly how much it's going to save because it's, we don't know who's going to be born tomorrow and what diseases they may have, right? So there's tons of uncertainty. So what you could do is get like a get a rough estimate of well, maybe it'll save us a million dollars um, a month. Uh, it's kind of too low. A million dollars a day, let's say. I don't know. These are all too low numbers, but a million dollars a day. It might save us nothing, right? But I ha and there's like a thirty percent chance of this, and there's like a seventy percent chance of this, or whatever it is, right? We can assign probabilities to these different amounts that it may save us, and then try to estimate like well, okay, what is how do we put this into a cost benefit analysis, like? <coughs> I, I don't have like one billion and I have like maybe this, maybe that, maybe this other thing. So what you would want to do is figure out like how, do, how much weight we place on different amounts of savings and kind of say, well, why don't we put into our, net, our, into our NPV analysis instead of putting in maybe a million, maybe zero, maybe like we can put in this 200,000. And the reason is because, okay, this risky thing that we're in, this risky situation, has an expected utility for the government of this amount which is roughly equal to if we guaranteed this much savings, right? So in the NPV, instead of putting in the expected value of the savings, you can put in the expected utility of the savings as reflected by, um, you know, this, this weighted, or not weighted, excuse me, this sort of um, certainty equivalent based analysis. So instead of like, okay, maybe the, the, the Obama, or maybe Obamacare will save us a billion dollars, maybe it'll save us half a billion dollars, or maybe it'll save us nothing. Why don't we figure out, like, you know, how much that uncertainty is worth to us in savings? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a chance it'll really work out, but on average, maybe we think, it, you know, and we may think on average it's going to save us half a billion, but we don't like the uncertainty, so we're just going to roughly estimate that, you know, 0.2 billion is like a conservative certainty equivalent, right? That, this kind of hazy, uncertain future is roughly the same as if you guarantee that it's going to save us 2.2 2 billion, right, 200 million dollars. 
right? So that's what we're going to put into our NPV. We'll put in the certainty equivalent rather than the expected value, or, and rather than the extremes of probabilities or anything like that. So that's how it came up, right? When you have uncertainty in, in a cost-benefit analysis, you can use the certainty equivalent as a replacement for all the probabilities and the different possible outcomes, the different states of the world, the decision tree, it's all messy. Just find a certainty equivalent that makes you feel just as happy, roughly, as a government sitting there around the table um, to the situation that you're in and use that number. So it's kind of making a sort of uh, a somewhat intuitive point. Like, if you're sitting around a table and you're saying, like, Obamacare, we have no idea how much it's going to save. We think it'll probably save us some money. Well, what amount do are, are we, con like, if you gave us that amount of savings for sure, would we take it right, over what we currently have, which is this kind of uncertainty? And find the amount that you're just indifferent between and use that number, because that's the best estimate you can use. Um, so that's, that's kind of the context in which it came up. So I guess that's maybe the most likely, it's again conceptual a little bit. It's hard to actually do this, but um, she also did talk a little bit about where that concept comes from. So you, you could be tested on this as well, but I don't think you're likely to see an expected like a utility function and you have to do all these calculations. I don't know if that's going to come up. This is changing gears because I know you only have a few more minutes. But for the previous tests, you've like kind of speculated on what you think is likely to be on there. Are there anything, there anything that you think is likely to be on? Um, so it's tricky. I mean, with um, uh, it's tricky with uh, uh, Professor uh, Singala because she, you know, um, changes the course a lot every year. So I don't have like I have past years experience, but it's like they're not uh, as relevant as like for one hundred and one or whatever, where I'm much more clear on like what, what's going to happen. Um, I, it, I think it'll be more heavily focused on the second half. Um, I think it's more conceptual, like um, in nature. Um, there's not going to be as many models, maybe not as many numbers. Um, I would think you would you would be likely to. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you, again, if you go through like my my handout sheet, right, you've got like social security, health insurance, unemployment insurance, state and local cost benefit analysis. But there's like five kind of categ I've like categorized it into five sort of buckets. Um, and really, some of these are pretty small. I mean, we didn't talk about unemployment insurance that long, state and local government that long. So those are almost like little questions that I can imagine being more heavily covered in like a short answer-y type of section. Um, but the longer sort of like formal questions would be like, you know, maybe the benefits taxes. Like if you're looking for like the model questions, maybe the benefits taxes, maybe like the kind of health insurance-y sort of question, um, you know, with the, the different types of sick people and their probabilities of illness and all that, um, which I think you guys did in the homework as well as uh, in, in review. Um, so, but I mean, beyond that, there's, and the cost benefit analysis, of course, uh, like a miniaturized version of what we did, or maybe something similar to that, given a discount rate or, you know, whatever. Um, so I think maybe those would be the more analytic type of questions, would be my guess. Um, and then the other things are just going to be, can you write about, and this is a good thing to think about when you're studying, like, can you write a paragraph about raising the retirement age of Social Security and the, the good and bad things about it? Really kind of go to all the concepts and say, what are the, what are the trade-offs? inherent in this decision, raising the retirement age, um, you know, reforming Medicare in X, Y, Z ways, um, the TBU model, like what are the good things, what are the bad things, what are the, you know, equity versus efficiency issues, right, so equity versus efficiency is a frame you want to have throughout, right, raising the retirement age, what are the equity and efficiency concerns or considerations you need to take into, in, into account. So it's always about like trade-offs between these, between these different pros and cons and having a way to talk about those pros and cons. So I would make a list of like all the different kind of concepts, right, um, <coughs> reforms that we've talked about for these, these these kind of policies, and then like the distributional issues inherent in those. I know that um, that's something the professor cares a lot about um, and has mentioned in the past. So um, I would say that's probably a good place to, to start. Um, and yeah, thinking about trade-offs, equity versus efficiency um, is, is a good frame for, for everything. Um, so get together with a group, make a list, and just kind of like sit around and each person throws out a thing. And you say, like, here's the good things, here's the bad things, and discuss for a couple minutes as a group, and then move on, right? And just see how many you can hit. Um, and that's a pretty good study technique, I would say. Okay, I think, I think we're supposed to leave because somebody else is coming in here, but they're not here yet. So, um, but I did say I'd be down to study, so I'm going to move down there. And um, you're welcome to, to join me or uh, not. Uh, thanks, guys. Thank you. I think that's it for your year. You don't have to deal with me anymore. I know that you're